You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. This message was recorded live at our Manchester campus. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. It was 1853 and America hosted its first World's Fair in New York City. The organizers built an exhibition hall called the Crystal Palace to showcase the latest and greatest innovation of their time. And there was a man there by the name of Elisha Otis who stole the show by pulling off a stun for the ages. Otis was the inventor of the elliptic, ele- elevator safety brake. But he had a hard time selling the safety f- first thing to the skeptics because at that point in time in New York, there were very few buildings that were higher than five story. So to do what he needed to do, to sell what he needed to sell, he did this. Or he stood on a platform high above the Crystal Palace and he had an x men position above the elevator shaft and he yelled out loud enough so that everyone can hear him in the exhibition hall and he said this, cut the rope. Cut the rope. The crowd held his collective breath at a point in time and watched the elevator drop a few feet and stop. Otis announced, all is safe, ladies and gentlemen. All is safe. The safety brakes worked. And this was the greatest sales speech at a point in time. When Otis said, cut the rope, like I said just now, there are only five or six story buildings in that place at that point in time. And no one wanted to take the staircase. I don't want, how many of you like to take staircase? When you got an elevator, you use the elevator, right? You're not Christians. I was was trying to do a salvation altar call just now. Like 60 people raised their hands and it didn't work. In 1854, Otis installed an elevator in the building on Broadway. The rest became history. By 1908, there were 530 buildings in New York City that qualified as skyscrapers. It's safe to say that what Otis did at that point in time turned the world upside down. And there's a moment in your life where you need to cut the rope. There's a moment in your life you have to make a decision that's going to change your life forever. See, the greatest risk is not taking any risk at all. The greatest risk, the greatest risk is this, you live life safely to arrive at death. And a lot of us live life like that because we think as long as we can save ourselves, live safely, we will arrive at heaven and we'll be happy. But imagine this, if you arrive in heaven and your life is just safe, what would God say to you? Hey, Cyrus, you slipped the safe life. Come to heaven. This is your hut. Because I realize I don't want to live a safe life. I want to live a challenged life. I want to live a God-ordained life. So if you have your Bible with you, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 8. These are the names of David's mighty warriors. And I do this joke in this passage of the Bible, which I can't do here, because it might be sensitive. Because I'm a guy that likes stand-up comedians. Okay, I, I'm, I like stand-up comedians. I like to laugh. And some of you like to cry. And some of you are forever sad. I like to laugh. And one of my favorite comedians in, 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 that I like to listen to is called Joe Coy. Joe Coy is a Filipino-American. And, and this verse, when I read it, the name, I want you to imagine he's a Filipino Jew. And he read, like, he's right, right there. Joseph, the son of Bathsheba, the Tecomite. So every time you read it, read Joseph and sound Filipino. The Bible is interesting. You know my name is in the Bible? My great, great, great ancestors are in the Bible? There's a Bani in the Bible? None of you are reading the Bible. And then they look at me like, yeah, there's a Bani in the Bible. Google it was the chief of three. He raised his spear against 800 men who he killed in one encounter. If you have a Bible, underline the word one encounter. There's a moment in every journey where you got to raise the spear. You go big or go home. There's a moment in your life when you don't care what the odds are. There may be 800 to one, but you know God is for you and with you. You see, in the manger, God was with us. At Calvary, God was for us. At the upper room, God is in us. God has been with you for a long time. It's for you to step up right now. 
The odds were 800 to 1 in one encounter. And I can imagine Joseph took a photo and pasted, put it on his Instagram. And it looked something like this. And I know Joseph looks like that. I'm underneath his clothes, I look exactly like that. I mean, most of us will run away when the odds are great. But I want to say this, Joseph didn't run away. When the odds are long, the odds are hard, God loves long shots. My God lives for that. To the infinite, all, all things are finer. There's no possible or impossible. There's no degree of difficulty. To Him, all things are possible and nothing is impossible. Those long odds, God loves them. Because the impossible odds, that's the stage for God's greatest miracle. When the odds were there, when they were standing in front of the Red Sea and there was no way to go and the Egyptian army behind them, God loved that odds. You got to understand this. This Bible is full of long shots and how God came true every single time. The motto of the Hunger Game is this, may the odds ever be in your favor, but that's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is this, may the odds be against you because that's when God comes true for you. That's when God comes up and shows off and shows off His glory. I love it when, when things are going wrong and I'm waiting for that one moment, the one thing that I need to do to have my breakthrough. I love it. I love those moments because I can't take credit for it. Unless God does it, it cannot be done. I love those moments because it sets me up to believe God for greater things. And somewhere along the line, most of us, Somewhere along the line, most of us don't want to play the odds. We give up. We live a simple life, safe life. And we go through life experiencing nothing. If the odds are set against you, I want to say this. It is an opportunity for God to do something. And I like the odds because that's when I cannot rob the glory of God. Because that's when he does the impossible. Things that I cannot do. When God shows up in a meeting and half the meeting is on the floor, I like it. You know why? Because I know it's not me. It's not the music. It's him. And I love those moments. I mean, think about it, Joseph. It was a one-to-one -one battle. It was a 50% chance. Chances are you win or lose. It's a flip of a coin. But 800 to one, that odds is great. That is impossible, but that's when you get your promotion. That's how you get your name in the Bible. Because when the odds are against you and you don't run away, you become what God has called you to be. See, we should not run away from the odds. Even though they're 800 to 1. If it's impossible, remember, he says, I am possible. And I think like, we, we, when you, I, one of the things that I learned about the Bible is this, recent, ever since COVID is this, Take time to meditate. I mean, really take time to meditate. Because sometimes we read a passage and we don't understand the magnitude of the miracle of God. We don't understand what God is doing at that point in time. Do you know the, the, the quail? I'm getting off topic right now. The quail in the desert, when Moses, the people complained that they have no meat to eat and God gives them the quail. Do you know Quails are birds that fly near the seashore and they were 50 miles from the nearest coast. For that to happen, God had to create a wind that was so strong to carry the birds. 50 miles. And here's the best thing. The Bible says there was a day's walk in either direction. It's about 20, 20 miles. You calculate the whole thing, it's about 700 square miles of birds. And he says, you got to carry 200 liters of birds, which is going to feed you from. I mean, how great is that miracle? And then we, we, oh, God fed them with quails. I mean, like, understand there's so much depth to the word of God. There's so much revelation. And I like this one verse, that's two words in this verse. It's so pregnant with possibilities, full of hope. One encounter. One encounter. You are one encounter away from your alternate reality. You're one encounter away from a different life. And I know this because I believe God has been ordering your footstep. I believe God is preparing you in advance. And I believe God is strategically positioning you for such a time as this, for this moment, for this hour. So don't miss tonight. Don't miss. Because I don't believe in coincidence. I believe in eternal providence.
There's a provision of God for every single act. And I come to church, I don't come to church thinking what's going to happen. I come believing with holy anticipation. I come believing God's about to do something. And the worst thing that we could ever do is just come to church and don't expect anything from God. I come with this desire to say, God, do something today. I don't want a single person to walk out of this place and miss what God is doing. Because I know God is always working behind the scene and God is setting you up for something. And if you get into the flow of God, man, things are going to be crazy. I don't know where and how and what God is going to do, but I believe one day He's going to show up and show off His glory, His goodness, and His grace. And all we got to do is show up. It's just belief. I've learned that faith, you know, over the years I preach a lot about faith, and I, I try to simplify faith. I just say belief. Faith is the willingness to look stupid or foolish. I mean, Think about it, Noah building an ark in the middle of the desert. Doesn't make sense. It seems foolish. But when God comes true, until it's accomplished, it always seems foolish. You got to believe. I don't know what God is asking you to do. Sometimes, sometimes God will tell you something and you get frustrated with God. Like God tells me, honor the Holy Spirit. You mean I'm not doing that? I love the Holy Spirit, but now I want you to say it on stage. My first question to God when God told me that, is says, do I need to do it outside of my church? Because it's, it's easy to honor the Holy Spirit in my church because my church loves the Holy Spirit. They love me. They're obedient to me. When I say, let's honor, they honor. But when I go to other churches, people are weird. Not your neighbor and say, neighbor. Pastor is talking about somebody from another row. I mean, people ask, why? Why must I do this? No, no, it's not a question of why. When you give God widow power, you don't have the right to ask why. And I've learned this. It looks foolish. The other day, in my, you know, one of our working nights, God tells me, Sarah, I want you to fall prostrate. My first thing was this, God, the carpet stinks. But the next minute, I'm down on my floor, face down. It still stinks, but I obeyed. Sometimes we just need to obey and do it. See, I've learned this thing about faith. Faith is taking the first step before God reveals the second step. You got to take the first step. See, most of us are waiting for God to move. You know, like when, when we do soaking meetings in our church, it's like everybody's waiting for the pastor to do something. And I purposely don't do anything. And see the reaction. Say, no, no, you take the first step. You don't need an altar call. You don't need an invitation to the praise pit. You just get up. You just do it. My pastor, how do I know if God's going to show up? I don't know. But if I keep doing what he tells me to do, one day he's going to do what he still just told me to do. And that's the thing that I want to focus on. And a lot of us get stuck. We go to this place where we begin to question, oh, why is the pastor asking me to do Should I give? Should I do this? Should I? Don't go there. That's where you get stuck. And you never move out of that place. You know, I don't know the... 30 years ago, I, I didn't know the magnitude of what God is going to do in my life when I made the decision to follow Jesus and give my life and go to full-time ministry. But when I stand in my church and I look at the hundreds of lives that has been changed, I'm humbled. I... I thank God, God did not tell me everything about my life that's going to happen in my life because I would have told him, keep it. <laughs> thank you, but no thank you. You know why? Because it will shock you what God can do through you if you just obey. And I like this passage. You know, in the realm of physics, there's this phenomenon called precession. Precession. Now, I'm going to tell you the technical terms so that I sound intelligent. And if you're in the world of physics, you will agree with me. It's a change in the orientation of the rotating axis of the rotating object. If you understand that, you are smarter than me. Because it took me a long time to figure that out. But let me paint a picture for you. It's like a spinning top. As the spot, you throw the top on the floor, it spins straight. After a while, as the, the rotation slows down, the axis gets wider and wider and wider and wider and it comes to a standstill. It is like this. Let me make it even more simpler. It is like a ripple effect. 
When you take a stone and throw it into a water, the first impact may be great, but after that, the ripple effect goes further and further and further and further and further away. Here's the truth about you and I. Every decision we make, every decision we take has a great impact upon life that goes beyond our ability to comprehend and understand of that, what that decision means. The decision you make today echoes in eternity. That's the decision you make. And the thing is this, our action or inaction, our decision or indecision is this. At the end of the day, there is an act result. Whether you come out or not, it's tough to comprehend the cause and effect of what you're deciding right now because you are not in control of what's going to happen. But you are in control of the decision. If you're in control of the decision, then let him be in control of the repercussion. That's how great it is. And now you don't know how the future tense impact of your one decision is like. Your decision will make a difference. Your decision will have an impact. And here's the best part, and I say this to my church all the time, your one decision is not just about you, it is about the you beside you, and it's going to impact not just you, but your family, your generation, the third generation, the fourth generation. That's how powerful your one decision is. That one decision. And as I sit in my church, I, I look at the families that come to salvation. And I'm thinking, one person made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. And now, all of them are here. I have no idea the ripple effect of one encounter with God that changed the trajectory of my life. Do you know this? My wife's family, all of them were non-Christians when we started our church. All of them. Okay? Right now, all of them are saved and in our church. You don't understand the ripple effect of one person saying yes to Jesus many, many years ago and the impact that comes after that. One person said yes. And the thing about this is that you can't control the ripple effect. You can't control when God shows up. But I promise you, He will always show up. He will always show up and show you how powerful it is. Let me say this, you're one risk away from a different reality. You're one idea away from a different, totally different mentality. You're one decision away from a totally different eternity. And that's how powerful it is. That's why people ask me all these things. My sermons, why, Pastor, why do you preach like I'm, I'm, I'm here more, hum, I'm more cultured when I'm in England. I'm more soft, speak properly. In my church, I'll be running up and down stage. I wouldn't be wearing a jacket, I'll be sweating. Why? Because number one, my stage is big. So walking one end of the stage burns 100 calories. And people ask me, Pastor, why do you preach so loud? Why are you so, so energetic? Why are you so passionate? Why are you, why? What's wrong with you? Are you? Do you have ADD? I said, no, maybe. <laughs> but here's what I know. I know this. In my sermon, my prayer is this. Every morning when I'm about to preach, God, in my life, in my ministry, in my sermon, today let there be the next Elijah, the next Elisha, the next Billy Graham, the next somebody who will say, you know, this is my moment. I don't know what I'm doing, but I do know God is in control of my life. So I'm taking the stage. We don't preach for ourselves. We don't preach for the applause of man, but the applause of one who is called my God. And I do this and I think, why do I keep doing this? And there are times where you feel like you want to give up. But those are the times that I realize somebody rose up. I look at my staff, I look at my family, and I say, they heard something, not from me, but the voice behind my voice. That's how powerful it is. And I, I don't think you do. Joseph was not looking for a fight. He encountered a fight. And he encountered the odds. The odds were 800 to 1. I'm thinking right now, that must be crazy. Because if you see a, a group of 800 people and you're one person with a spear, I'll run, naturally speaking, right? I'll run. Because 800 is a lot. I mean, two is a lot for me. I'm not a fighter. I'm a lover of Jesus Christ. Okay? My philosophy is, whenever there's a fight, the Indian in me comes in. I start negotiating. Okay, so 800 people standing in front of me and he says, come on, let's charge. Because in the eyes of Joseph was this, he did not see 800 problems, he saw 800 opportunities. That's the great thing about having God on your side. 
Because every, the Chinese word for crisis is crisis or a problem, but the other word is this, opportunities. And if you look at the opportunity not as a crisis, that's when you raise up your spirit and says, with God, I can do all things. I mean, Joseph, when he goes back to his town, he had a great story to tell. He would have taken out, he would have said, had a lot of likes on his Instagram. A Jew gram. And he goes to the city and he just tells stories. Right? I mean, tell, I mean, I went out there, I had one spear and 800 people were killed. Let me ask you a question. Are you living your life in a way that is worthy of telling stories about? When was the last time you told a story about God? I'm not talking about your love story. You want to hear my love story? This is how my love story started. And it's a very good story. You can't apply it, okay? I was one day praying in my dormitory, in seminary, in Bible school, and God just drops a name. This is your wife. I have not seen her. I don't know she exists, but I only had a name, Felina. Six months later, name had a face and a body, both beautiful. That's my story. What's yours? What story is your, your life telling you? Because right now I tell you, if people don't read the Bible, they're reading you. What story are you saying? Here's the second question I want to ask you. What are you doing today that will make a difference a hundred years from now? You say, oh, Pastor, I can't see a hundred years from now. You don't have to see a hundred years. You just do today. Let God worry about the hundred years. You know, in, in the realm of psychology, they, say, they have this phenomenon called inaction inertia. It says when you miss an opportunity, chances are you're going to miss more opportunities. You're going to miss more and more. And time after time, instead of taking those opportunities, you're going to miss them. It's a natural tendency to keep doing the same thing you've been doing and then miss out on everything. It's keep thinking the same thoughts and miss out what God can do in your life. You see, God cannot do something new if you're doing the same old thing. God cannot do something new in your life. So I, I like churches where there yeah, are this freedom, like this church, freedom. They tell me, Pastor, you want to preach as long as you want, you can. It's a freedom. But you will not be here, but it's a freedom. <laughs> I like the pastor came up, he said, hey, Sarah, you can, you, can, you, can, you can lead into worship. You know, they're going to sing a call, song called Breathe. And I go, <gasps> I like that kind of church because it gives space for the Holy Spirit to move. See, most of us keep doing the same thing because it's comfortable. It's easy. We are, we're creatures of habit, let's be honest. Okay? But here's the thing. If you're comfortable, you can't grow. Tell me the last time you were comf uncomfortable and I'll tell you the last time you grew. Tell me. I promise you, I'll show you when you grew. You know, people tell me like, Pastor, I, 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 don't, I don't want to breathe the right Bible once. I, I'm, I struggle reading. I tell you what, read it three times a day. Take a passage, read it in the morning. In the afternoon, just before your lunch, audio listen to the passage. At night, read it again. I promise you, it will speak to you. I promise you, it will speak to you. Because in the kingdom of God, there's no such thing as status quo. You're either hot or cold. At least God knows what to do with you. But if you're lukewarm, He's going to spit you out. How many of you are lukewarm? Raise your hands. <laughs> Trick question. Just to pay attention. See, I learned this thing. It is in the discomfort of life that you arrive at the things where God has for you. The prayer, I, I, wish, I wish prayer was like one minute. That was easy. I got, to I got to engage. Got to pray longer and harder. Can I ask this thing of church? What do you do make a difference? What are you doing? What are you doing? Every single week, every single day, what are you doing that's making a difference in your life? 
And don't worry about it. I want you to understand the little, little things, the small act of kindness that you do. You know, I, I walk around, I walk around Manchester with, I don't know about you, but I walk around Manchester with a one dollar coin, one pound coin. Because every time I use cash, they give me coins and they're heavy. You know what I do? I go give it to the people on the streets. Just drop it off. You know what's my greatest joy? When somebody is in the streets and you give him money and he's excited and he says, God bless you. That's my moment. That's the little act of kindness. Sacrifices that you make that nobody sees. Prayers that you say that nobody hears. The little steps of faith that scare you to death. Those make a difference in your life. He had the courage to raise the spear even though he was outnumbered 800 to 1 because he had one revelation that God was with him. If God is on your side, you have the favor of God on your side. And the favor of God, when the favor of God is upon you, you don't fear anything because you know God is for you and it's not against you. And whoever is against you doesn't fight you, he fights your God. That's how true it is. And your thing about your life is this, your life predates you. Every single step of your life has been set up by God before you were born. God designed your life before He designed you. He thought about you, He had every single thought about you, every single second. That's how precious and important you are to God. He thought about you. And your dreams and His dreams for your life post-dates you. And if we can get into that place, I tell you, you're going to not change your life, you're going to change generation. Legacy is for me is this. It inspires others to dream because you dream. It inspires others to dream because you dream. And I pray every single time I'm on stage, God inspires somebody to aspire to greatness, not settle for mediocrity. Inspires somebody to rise up and say, I want to serve God. I want to give my rest of my life to serve God. I want to give the rest of my life to do what God has called me to do. You know, at the end of the day, none of us are standing on our own. We're all standing on the shoulders of giants. I'm standing on the shoulders of Pastor Russell, Pastor Neil, Pastor Glynn, Pastor Sof. I'm standing on the shoulders of my wife. I'm standing on the shoulders. And the great thing about standing on the shoulders of people is this. They have paid a certain price so that you can look further than them. You can look greater. You can ask for more. You can believe God starting a church where nobody wants to come to me and you say, God, I believe you. I didn't know what I was doing when I started the church, but, but somehow or another, it all worked out. Here's the truth. Our legacy is leveraging the dreams of those who come after us. My dream is this. One day, my children will rise up to do what God has called them to do because their parents have paid the price. And they have seen how God, is. my parents paid the price and I'm paying the price. And my children will have their chance. And I pray, my prayer is this, they will have a greater vision than I have. Because that's the call of every parent. This is the call of every member in the church to have a greater vision of God for your life. Don't settle. Just believe. And I promise you, you're going to have influence over billions. Not thousands or millions, but billions. And I want to end with this one statement. True success is both succession and precession. If the success doesn't carry forward, it's not real success. I want to end with this story. On April 21st, 1855, a Sunday school teacher by the name of Edward Kimball walked into a shoe store in Boston. He befriended a young man, a young shoe salesman, and shared the gospel with him. That day, the young shoe salesman invited Jesus into his life. And the young man's name was D.L. Moody. Moody later became an evangelist and preached all over the U.S. In 1879, Moody decided to go to England and held a series of evangelistic meetings there. And there was a man by the name of F.B. Mayer, whose goal in life was to become rich and famous. F.B. Mayer heard D.L. Moody and he gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And he later became a powerful preacher himself. Then Mayer decided to come to the United States and preach in packed auditoriums throughout New England and the Atlantic coast. And one of those who heard Mayer preach was this guy called J. Wilbur Chapman. Chapman was so sold so by the gospel of Jesus Christ, he decided to become an evangelist. 
Chapman later was involved in an organization that was sharing the gospel to sports athletes. It was called YMCA. And he got to know a famous pro baseball player by the name of Billy Sunday. In 1886, Billy Sunday asked Jesus to be the Lord of his life. He started working with Wilbur Chapman and he became a revivalist. Later on, he was invited by a group of businessmen to Charlotte, North Carolina to encourage other preachers. And one of the preachers that was so impacted by the sharing of Billy Sunday was this guy called Mordecai Ham. In 1934, Mordecai, during one of Mordecai's evangelistic meetings, there was a troubled young man sitting in the audience. He was struggling with God. By the end of the service, this young man walked forward to ask Jesus to take control of his life. This young man's name was Billy Graham. Nobody really knows how many lives Billy Graham has impacted. They believe 250 million has heard him preach and still people are listening to him preach. But here's the thing. It started many, many years ago by one man who decided to say, you know what? I'm going to share the gospel with this shoe salesman. And what he didn't know that day was that was the God-ordained plan to bring Billy Graham and make him the greatest evangelist of our time. I don't know what God can do in your life. But I do know this. If you put your hands into His, your life into His hands, I promise you, He can do miracles. He can do the impossible. I don't know what risks you need to take. I don't know what decision you need to make. I don't know what opportunity you need to take. But I know this. The first step is the hardest step. The first step seems impossible. But I promise you, take that first step and you will see the second step. Take the second step, you'll see the third step and soon you'll be on a journey with God. And a journey that is not boring. It's exciting. Because the odds are against you. But the favour of God is for you. So you got to believe. You got to believe. You got to take that step. Here's the thing. I learned that you cannot finish what you have not started. But I also believe he who began a good work in you will not stop until it's complete. So you got to believe. I'm inspired not by the impossibilities, but I'm inspired the possibilities of God. There's so much. This book is full of odds. Stacked against the people of God. But this book is full of the promises of God and their yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Come on, let's stand up right now. The odds be against you. I don't know what you need, but I know this, the God who knows you knows what you need. And He's waiting. He's waiting for you to do something powerful. He's at the edge of His seat. Come on. Thank you for listening to this Audacious podcast. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. 